So this topic, the last one before the break, is about cannabinoids. So I happen to be uh, from a country that actually has made it legal everywhere. I have rued that decision because of what's happened in our emergency department as a result. But it has now been legal since October 10th, 2018 in Canada. So we're going to talk about cannabinoids and what their impact is in the emergency department. So what we see, and I wrote this down, the things that we have seen skyrocket since legal legalization of marijuana. One, far more motor vehicle collisions involving marijuana. Two, intoxications from edibles has skyrocketed because people don't know the dose of what they're getting. And so they think three or four gummy bears are just like, oh, I could take three or four gummy bears. And they're psychotic, they're agitated, they're paranoid, and they're coming in intoxicated with the cannabinoids. We see kids eating gummy bears, so they're intoxicated. We see lots of hyperemesis. I am so tired of hyperemesis from cannabinoids. I'm so tired of it. We probably see at least 15 to 20 cases a week. I'm just so tired of seeing it. Uh, severe dysautonomia and psychiatric issues with severe paranoid psychosis and agitation. And our waiting rooms now stink. They all stink. Because everybody between the age of about 15 and 50 seems to come into my hospital reeking of marijuana. Now, there was an interesting statistic when it was illegal that if you took people who took alcohol and compared them to people who smoked marijuana, the risk of taking cocaine or heroin was 140 times greater if you smoked marijuana than if you drank alcohol. There was a while where people said, well, marijuana is a gateway drug. I don't think that's a proper term. And what will be interesting to see is now that it's legal, in the same way that alcohol is legal, will that increased propensity to go to stronger drugs disappear? Because really what it was with marijuana, part of it was you're going across a legal threshold. You're breaking the law to de get a drug. And well, if I've broken one law, it's not such a big deal to break another law to get some cocaine. So part of that certainly had to deal with that. And it'd be interesting to see what the propensity towards stronger drugs is now that this is legal. What's scaring me a bit is that almost every major distillery company in Canada is looking at making infusions. So a combination cannabinoid alcohol. Oh yeah, it's coming. And of course, that means you'll be able to ram your car into another car and not be at a toxic level for alcohol or marijuana, but be incapacitated because you'll have taken two substances. How we're going to deal with that, we don't know yet. The other thing is in Toronto area, in the Ontario province of Ontario where it's been legal since October, there was a, people in municipalities, each municipality was offered the choice to opt in or opt out. Do you want to have marijuana shops in your community? And over 50% of communities said, we don't want them. So for example, I live in Mississauga, 750, 800,000 people. Um, there are not going to be any marijuana shops. I go north to the next community, Brampton, 450,000 people, they're going to have shops. The problem is going to be the other city beside me, Oakville, won't have any shops. So what will happen is, although we've made it legal, there will still be a large market for illegal sales. Just like there's a large market for illegal cigarette sales. Just like there's a market for illegal alcohol sales. Absolutely. There's a lot of Canadian doctors making money on stocks. You can't ever upset, get upset about someone making money in a capitalistic environment. That's the whole point of a capitalistic environment. Um, so uh, there are many proposed medical uses. Some have worked very well, but it's almost all an anecdotal basis because it's almost impossible to do proper research on an illegal drug. It's become legal in many states. It's become legal in Canada. But the problem is in the states, it's still a Schedule I drug. So it becomes, it's still impossible to do proper research because it's a Schedule I drug. Hopefully, in Canada, 
there will be some research that starts coming so, so we can get better answers. Um, I've written down, it's been used for treatment of seizures, we'll talk about a little bit later, glaucoma, palliative care world, MS. I can tell you that I have seen astounding results in MS patients who have severe pain or even neurologic dysfunction from neuropathies. They put, get put on uh, high CBD content uh, cannabinoids and are functional within days. Um, the problem is the literature is so scant, it's all anecdotal. And therefore you have believers and not to in any way besmirch the reputation of any church. But I could go to St. Anne de Beaupre in the province of Quebec and I can find over a million crutches thrown away by people who, be, who became able to walk after going to that church. So when people say, I smoked marijuana and I got better, there is a placebo effect that is not to be denied. I just don't know, because I don't have the literature, how much is real, how much is placebo. I just don't know. I do know that in the chronic pain world, even though it has benefits for neuropathic pain, it is a fourth line recommendation for neuropathic pain because the literature is not very good and because the results are very scattered. Um, what else? Okay, synthetic cannabinoids. Remember the era about five, six years ago of bath salts? Right? They were legal. And you could buy them on the internet because the bags were written not for human consumption. And it was legal to take them. Why? Because as long as you make a new drug that's been changed by one molecule so it's not the same drug as on the DEA list, it's legal. Because until the DEA knows about it and is aware of it and makes it illegal, the drug you take is legal. See, it's sort of a perverse way of things working, but it's the way it is. It's sort of like steroids in sports. When you could get the clear and put it on and no one could detect it, you were taking something legal because no one could prove that you were taking it. So synthetic cannabinoids, there's two or three articles there because they talk about J.W. Huffman. Do any of you, have any of you read this literature? That he kept coming up with a different cannabinoid every week by playing and tinkering with molecules. And they were all legal because the DEA hadn't heard of them. But like a lot of things that um, are tinkered with, there were things that started happening. Tachycardia, nausea, hypokalemia, hypertension, restlessness, agitation, diplopia, seizures, CNS depression, seizures, sign of sympathomimetic toxicity, T-wave inversion, bradycardia on your ECG, in addition to getting high. So they got all these more and more alarming side effects on drugs that were, in theory, legal. And because he was making a new one every week, the, the DEA and everybody couldn't keep up banning the substances. So number four, acute effects of a synthetic cannabinoids, update 2015, 114 people seen. More serious atypical events occurred, such as renal injury, CVA, MI, convulsions, hyperemesis, death occurred in 21% of the 114. It really is remarkable what people are willing to put in their body. You know, it always surprises me, you know, this line from one of my colleagues many years ago was this patient came in and taken a whole bunch of cocaine and was delirious and raving and hallucinating. And the physician, in a spiteful moment, went up to the patient and said, you take this drug to feel good. Do you feel good now? <laughs> Rather inappropriate, very unprofessional, but we see that end of the curve. There is a rave in a park less than a kilometer from our hospital every summer. We all try to be out of town those three days. There's about 10,000 people it's been going on for I don't know how many years. And like most raves, ecstasy is the drug of choice. We average 50 people a day from a drug that's safe and fun. We've seen sodiums actually below 100. 
from people who just drink and drink and drink and drink and drink because they've taken so much. You get comments like, this person comes in, temperature is 44 degrees, pulse is 190. It takes 20 milligrams of lorazepam to calm the person down. She finally calms down, wakes up and said, so what'd you take? I know what she took. She took a whole bunch of ecstasy. What'd you take? I don't know. There were a bunch of pills lying in the mud. I picked them up and my friend said it'd be okay to take them, so I took them all. In the mud. You know. <laughs> it's what people take when they're intoxicated is mind-boggling. And, and there's no rationale. You just go with the flow and take care of their symptoms. And when she said they were in the mud, my friend said they were okay, so I took them all. You just realize the brains aren't quite working the same way as ours. All right. Can the emergency physician rely on drug testing for marijuana-related diagnostic evaluation? This is a whole topic here in drug screening. Heroin is, is really good when it's positive. Cocaine is very positive. It's true, you can rely on it. After that, it gets really mus messy. And the problem with marijuana is it's positive for up to three weeks. So someone may have smoked a joint two weeks ago. And they come in and they're altered now. And you do a year in drug screen that shows marijuana, it doesn't mean anything. It has no bearing on what's in front of you, like a lot of things. It also doesn't tell you how often the patient's smoking marijuana. So screening for marijuana in the urine is basically a fool's game. But it is true, however, there are thresholds. So a poppy seed muffin does not test positive for heroin. I know... I've had way too many people in the chronic pain in clinics try to tell me, well, I had a poppy seed muffin this morning. Nice try. But that's not true. It's also true that you can't have a positive urine drug screen for marijuana because you're in a room with other people smoking. Okay? That was tried by a Canadian skier at the Olympics. Snowboarder. He said, oh, I was in a room with a bunch of people smoking. That's why I tested positive. Nice try, but that's not true. So there are thresholds for these things. Um, number five is a pretty decent review you might want to go through on your own time. Get the article, read it, because it really does talk about the pros and cons of urine drug screening properly. And I think it gives you a good base for knowing when to use it when you're in practice. It's a decent review article. Receptor biology. It's really odd if you were involved in neurobiology. I actually wrote a paper um, for the Annals of Emergency Medicine a, a few years back about uh, state-of-the-art pain management, and half my article was on the neurobiology of pain. I have a friend of mine from Ontario, Sean Moore. He and I give a lot of lectures together. We write a lot of articles together because we're, we're both knowledgeable in pain and addiction, so we, can, we work together a lot on this. And Sean says to me, whenever we give these like full day things on pain and addiction, Sean keeps telling me, Jim, you give the talk on neurobiology. I don't understand a thing. Just, can you just do it? I wrote this article on neurobiology because the uh, section editor for the annals, who was also interested in pain research, says, Jim, I want you to write this. And so he edits my, my, my submission, except the whole part on neurobiology doesn't have a single mark in it. So I write it back. I said, you haven't edited the neurobiology part. He says, well, I didn't understand any of it. I said, then why are we putting it in the article? You asked for it because, because but you're doing pain research and you don't understand. He says, well, people have to know. So I assume nobody read the neurobiology part of that article. But if you study pain research and neurobiology and pathophysiology of pain, you realize that the number one receptor in your brain for addiction to heroin and to opioids is the cannabinoid one receptor. It's not a mu receptor or a kappa receptor. It's got no receptor related to opioids in your brain is responsible for addiction. It's the cannabinoid 1 receptor. If you take rats and you do studies on them and you do what's called drop-off gene research, so you develop strains of rats that actually, they don't have that gene. So they don't have the CBD1 receptor. No matter how much opioids you give them, because you can actually give them it's in cages and they go in and they get the dope and they come back and they go in and get dope. And the rats never develop addictive behavior. Ever. You put them back with a CBD1 gene back in them and then within two days they develop addictive behavior with opioids. So 
you should know that the receptor that most stimulates your brain from THC is the receptor that leads to addiction. Now, for some reason that nobody yet understands, even though THC, and to a lesser degree CBD, THC is most stimulant through the CBD1 receptor, THC does not stimulate the receptor as much as opioids towards addictive behavior. We don't know why. But it is true that people who smoke high THC marijuana develop addiction. It is not true that you can't become addicted to, a, to marijuana. Some people do. The proof is, how many of you have seen a patient with hyperemesis? Right? How many of them have told you, one, there's no way it's due to the marijuana? Right? Because that's what they take for chemotherapy, so you don't puke. And then when you finally get it through their brain, it really is due to the marijuana, how many of them won't stop? Because they can't. They're addicted. They will not stop because the definition of addiction is continuing to take a substance to bite proof of harm to oneself or one's environment. And when you're puking 20 times a day and you keep smoking your marijuana because you don't believe and you refuse to believe that it's due to the marijuana, that's called addiction. And so there is some evidence that marijuana is addictive. Now, how much of this hyperemesis is recent? Almost all of it, because don't forget, the strength and the amount of THC in marijuana has gone up markedly, and the strains today are 20 to 40 times more potent than they were 20 years ago. And you wait to see what happens over the next 10 years. Just like there are craft beers with craft flavors in every state, there will be craft marijuana. There will be the big companies, because I know Molson's and Coors are already buying marijuana companies so that they can have the big amount of mass production. But there will always be these craft places that have ratios of the chemicals and give you a certain high. And if you actually go to Amsterdam and go into a marijuana bar, there's like 40 choices for you. And the guy behind the bar, just like with scotch or with wine, will tell you the advantages of this one over the advantages of that one. This will give you this, but that one will give you that. And here's... And that's going to happen with marijuana in North America. So that means because each of them will have different ratios, each one of them will have different side effects. It's not like alcohol where there may be all sorts of different flavors and nuances. It's still just one molecule. And at beer in the United States, it's 3 or 5%. In Canada, yes, you can get up to 9% beer or 11% beer. Wine is 13% or 11%. Most alcohols are 40%. It's a fixed amount of intoxicant in what's your mind. In marijuana, that's not going to be true. It's going to be all over the board. So therefore, the side effects are going to be all over the board. And we're only going to learn that with time. What is butane hash oil? So this is remarkable because everybody figures out a way to make the next best thing. A butane hash oil, how many of you have seen this? Not yet, a couple, and isn't it great? More with less, right? So here's how it works. Hash is the wax on the leaf surface and buds of the plants, and it contains more THC than the leaves or stems. So butane lighter fluid dissolves out the THC quite nicely from the hash. So in a tube packed with high-potency buds with a THC, with a hash wax on it, they then put the butane lighter fluid in it, which dissolves out the THC, and it filters out. Then, of course, there's the tricky part. You have to get rid of the butane. Can anyone say crack? Remember, that's what happened with crack, right? To get crack, you had to mix it with a solvent that burnt, and then you had to burn it. And there was a certain uh, comedian who burned 80% of his body because of it. And so the number one, I remember when I was in L.A. in my residency, the number one cause of fires in L.A. three years in a row were crack fires because making the people were taking crack and then trying to use highly flammable substances to make the damn stuff, and so their buildings would go up in flames. So butane hash oil, you have to evaporate the butane after it's leached out the THC. 
So there's a problem sometimes with that. People get a little anxious, they try to burn it off with a flame, and things go where you would expect with butane. The only saving grace of butane is it has a relatively low temperature of burning. Because people use it for jewelry to melt lead and things like that. It doesn't give you a high temperature. It still burns you. Compared to 5% THC in plants, butane hash oil can have up to 95% THC. Because you can never get enough. 95%. So you can imagine one good big toke, you're gone. Does legalization of marijuana decrease opioid deaths? It sounds like an odd question, but there was a study number seven um, from Colorado that tried to suggest this was true. They said there was a 6% decrease uh, in mortality, but it was probably much more due to natural fluctuants and not controlling for t free Narcan programs and safe needle sites and everything else. Didn't control for those things. I can tell you in Canada in the six months since it's been legalized, the death rate from opioids is exactly the same every week as it was before marijuana was legalized. Because the people who are taking opioids are usually not the people smoking dope. There's a couple of articles there about um, pharmaceutical products. Um, Nabilone has been used for, I guess, about uh, 15 years for chronic pain. Sesamet, Sativex are, are products that are available for chronic pain. The problem with Sesamet is that you have to start so low to avoid people being drowsy. It takes you about 8 to 10 weeks of titration to get up to the 2 milligrams per day to avoid them just being zombies. It just takes forever to get them to the dose that might work. That's the problem with sesame. I actually saw a physician start somebody on lorazepam, sesame, and nortriptyline the same day. I intubated that patient the next day. They had taken two days of appropriate dosing of the three medications. And I had to intubate the patient. So there's that downside. Number eight, Cannabidiol improves frequency and severity of seizures. Now, this is an interesting study, just for you to keep in the back of your mind, because it's not something you're seeing anytime soon. It's a low-level evidence paper, but what it is is they took people who had been on multiple medications and kept having almost daily seizures. So these are really that 0.1% at the end of the bell-shaped curve who, who you know probably would do better with, with surgery uh, to, to stop the seizure. But these people were offered this. And with cannabidiol, there was a huge amount of adverse side effects to keep the patients on it. But by 12 weeks, the adverse event rate had settled down and seizure control was much better and sustained over the study period of a year. So it seems to be, if you can get through that 12-week period, that there might be some benefit for some specific patients. It's not a drug we're going to be using in the emergency department to stop seizures. But it shows you that our understanding of the neurobiology of cannabinoids is very flawed. And that as we have more and more marijuana available, as it's more and more legal, it'll be studied more. And the synthetics will be derived. We'll probably see some specific purposes, certain strains for people with MS, certain people with certain types of neuropathy, certain strains for people with other things. But we're also going to learn about all the bad sides. And what are we going to do to control those? So what is cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome and how can it be treated? Thank goodness there's a treatment. And what's the treatment? Haldol. Thank goodness there's a treatment. It is mind-boggling that once again, there's a study there um, that people tried to use on Dancitron. I don't know why on is so popular. It can't work on cannabinoids. So I don't know why they studied it. But for hyperemesis, halopyridol works. What's really neat, because of that CBD1 receptor and the affair with addiction, if you give someone two milligrams of hydromorphone IV, they stop vomiting immediately. Hydromorphone works just as well as halopyridol. The problem is it doesn't switch, turn the switch off permanently. In other words, you give them the, drop, the hydromorphone, and for three or four hours, they don't puke. The hydromorphone wears off, they start throwing up again. 
Whereas with haloperidol, when you give it to them, the switch gets turned off. And until they smoke marijuana again, they won't throw up. So both work, it's just the haloperidol is sustained and you can get them out of the emergency department. Uh, number nine is about haloperidol. It worked at 90% plus. And it works through the CB1 receptor. Number 10, this is a neat study. I'm not sure if I'd do it, but it's a neat study. It's a, only a case series of 13 people where, oh, Dancitron failed universally again. I don't know why anybody's giving these people on Dancitron. But what they did was they took the capsaicin cream and rubbed it on their belly. You guys have done that? It works. Yeah. Right. So this is a case series of 13. All had clinical success, but none had follow-up. They applied it to the abdomen. Why the abdomen? I'm not sure. And it generates heat. And I'm not sure if it works the same way that the hot baths or hot showers work. Because what do they all tell you when they come in? I kept lying in the tub because I felt so much better when I sat in the tub. So you tell them, you kept draining your hot water tank. Well, you, what you need is a tankless hot water system then. <laughs> Are there valid medical indications for MJ with demonstrated benefits? And again, I will tell you it's very sketchy. Um, I think there are some very good indications. I think it needs to be fleshed out so there's clear evidence. And hopefully now that's being legalized, we'll see that to be true. My, my concern is that while we're getting that cleared up, what we're going to see in the emergency department is more and more and more adverse events from people more and more and more taking this drug. To finish up, do brief interventions based in the emergency department work? In other words, I think you have a problem. I think you need to get off whatever it is you're taking, alcohol, marijuana, opioids, whatever. The answer is yes. And what they did was they looked at a 15-minute discussion with or without pamphlet and referral and a video where the patient just watches the video can replace the 15-minute discussion. And there was consistent demonstration of decreases in use of alcohol or other substances if the person got the discussion or the video in addition to being referred. So if you see someone with a substance use disorder and you just give them a pamphlet and say, you need to go to our chemical dependency unit, it works sort of, but not much. If you actually make them go through the video, which is probably better because it saves you time, or the 15-minute discussion with somebody, a social worker or something, you get much better results of people going to programs, getting involved, and it gives a much more of a chance of epiphany. And there's several studies about alcohol and marijuana and cocaine that have been shown this to be true. You can't just say, what you, you know, you're, you have a substance use disorder and you need to get involved in a clinic. Here's a pamphlet. What you need to do is actually sit down and talk with them or have a video to, for them to look at. Is it going to work on everybody? Absolutely not. But the data suggests at least 25 to 30 percent, percent respond to that 15-minute intervention. That's a pretty good response rate. And I think you should look into it. All right. Articles 12 and 13 support that. Yes. Just one second before you answer. What was that? Is that video on YouTube? Um, not that I'm aware. I have to remind you, you have blue sheets in front of you. If you don't fill them out, the panel discussion in 12 minutes will be kind of boring. Please fill them out. In Colorado now, you know what? If you actually go, this is an interesting point. If you go to Portugal... Portugal legalized everything because they found that it didn't change usage rates of any drug by having it legal or illegal. They got huge amounts of tax money because they legalized everything. Their crime rates plummeted, their economy improved, and the amount of absenteeism from work from drugs decreased. Prohibition has shown without a doubt that banning something doesn't work. The, drug, the war on drugs has shown through hundreds of billions of dollars that driving someone into the ground and putting people in jail doesn't stop people from taking cocaine. In fact, every year of the war on drugs, the use of cocaine went up in this country. Portugal has said, you know what? Screw it. We're going to legalize everything. Alcohol is legal. Marijuana is legal. So we'll just legalize everything. Every positive indicator is there. 
improve the economy in the country, decreased absenteeism, decreased uh, medical problems, um, everything, decreased criminal rates, everything. So if you're going to legalize something, just legalize everything. How about that for a philosophy? Take a break.